Inspirations can inspire, but it's our own way how we are going to take things forward. So it helps us to go forward. So with this, we will go into the first part of discussion and respect and answer. Okay, this is going to be development of the respect and plan. Okay, so development of respect and plan is again a very, very important uh, thing because, so because it develops as a but. Okay, and from birth, it becomes a lung. Okay, so what are the phase of development of lung? Okay, so if you take the first phase, the first phase is called the embryonic phase. Okay, embryonic phase. Okay, this embryonic phase is from day 26 of intra uterine life to 60 week of intra uterine life. This is where the lung behaves like a bird. Okay, so like the Tamil song, Muttugale Muttugale, Mooch Vida Muttugale. So the lung behaves like a butt, okay, it's just a butt. Okay, so it has no role in respiration in initial phases. Okay, so it has no role in respiration, it just develops. Okay, then in the next phase, it is going to be called as pseudo glandular phase. This is from 6th week of intra uterine life to 15th week of intra uterine life, and here we have terminal bronchioles. The lung matures into terminal bronchioles. So small bronchioles are formed. Okay, from there it enters into the next phase, which is called as canalicular phase. Canalicular phase. Which is from 16th week of intra uterine life till 26th week of intra uterine life, where the bronchioles will branch into alveolar ducts. Will branch into alveolar ducts. Then we have the next phase called the saccular phase. Saccular phase is from 26th week of intra uterine life till the birth. That is around some, somewhere around 36 week. Okay, it is where we are going to have alveolar sac. Okay, where it forms small, small sacs. Okay, small, small bulges. Okay, and this is the primitive alveolar. This is the primitive alveolar. Then we enter the next phase called as alveolar phase. Okay, alveolar phase is from 36th week of intra uterine life till one and a half years of age. That is around 18 months of your post delivery. Okay, this is the phase with the mature alveolar forms. So, if you take mature alveoli, mature alveoli forms from the term to one and a half years of age. Okay, so the complete lung development happens post natal. Okay, so these are the different phases of the development of the lung. Okay, if you see in this picture, also you can see the lung initially forms a lung bud. Okay, from the lung bud, what we are having, we are having terminal bronchioles. Okay, from there we have alveolar cells, and alveolar cells develops into uh, mature alveolar age, mature alveolar age. So this is how your lung develops, and these are the phases of lung development which are very very important. Okay, so by the end of eight years of age, by eight years of age, and on an average, okay, so you have around three hundred to four hundred million alveoli. So in your lung, there are around three hundred to four hundred. Million alveoli percent. Okay, so this is what happens. Okay, but if you take around this time, around this time, that is around 26 degree, the respiration is possible. Okay, the lung is possible or capable to do respiration, but it does not happen actually. Respiration is capable. Uh, 
So if I don't think I see it, this is another one. Okay, this is another one. Okay, so this is the anatomic registry. And if I'm going to consider this as a gun, okay, three or general conduits, we have two of arteries and veins. Okay, then artery and vein here are going to be called the bronchial artery and bronchial vein. Bronchial artery and bronchial vein. Well, if you take the alveolar, alveolar level, we have that pulmonary vasculature. Pulmonary vasculature where we have pulmonary capillaries, these capillaries take part in gaseous exchange. Capillaries take part in gaseous exchange. Okay, which is going to take part in gaseous exchange. Okay, the anion which is present in this anatomical dead zone or anatomical dead space can be measured by a technique called the power screening. Paulus technique, or it can be measured by a method called single bed nitrogen method. Single bed nitrogen method. Okay. The air in that nitrogen is which can be measured by Paulus technique and single bed. Okay, so this is the way how we can measure the anatomic distance. If you take the total distance in the body, it is equal to anatomical distance plus physiological distance. Okay, physiological distance. The total distance is equal to anatomical distance plus physiological distance. And normally, the anatomical distance is equal to 150 ml, and physiological distance is going to be zero. Physiological is no basis. Okay, so the total depth space is equal to 150 ml. But whenever you see this is as an alveoli, this is another alveoli. Now a patient has ARDS or pneumonia, for example, pneumonia is there. What happens here? In the alveoli, there is or Fluid. Okay, whenever there is a pulse or fluid, what is going to happen? The area is not going to get used for gas exchange. So, what will happen to the total displacement now? Increase. Okay, total displacement increases. Whenever, whenever there is a pathology involving the alveoli or its vasculature, then what happens? The total displacement increases. Okay, total displacement increases. Okay, so this occurs in anything which involves alveoli. Or interstitial or the even the resistance. Okay, then what is going to happen? The physiological history increases. Okay, whichever part of the alveoli is not used for gaseous exchange, then physiological exposure increases. Okay, physiological exposure increases. So this is about your dead space and its uh, significance, and you can measure it by how large it is, single bit. Nitrogen, single bed nitrogen. Okay, so this is very, very, very important. Very, very, very important. Thing. Okay, so now if you take your airway, the airway is a complex thing, okay, complex thing, which is going to have lot of variations, okay, lot of variations. Okay, so if you take the uh, airway, in airway, we, have, we, we usually take our airway from our nasal uh, mucosa. From the nasal cavity, you will enter into the different problems and alveolus. Okay. If you see the epithelium, okay, epithelium, from the nasal cavity till the bronchi, we have a special epithelium called as pseudo stratified ciliated columnar. Epithelium, pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. 
Okay, so this area of your lung is ciliated. Okay, then after that, if you go to parallel bronchioles, it is ciliated columnar epithelium, which is not pseudo stratified. Then, if you come to the respiratory bronchioles, the respiratory bronchioles has ciliated, pubovoidal epithelium, ciliated pubovoidal epithelium, ciliated pubovoidal epithelium. Okay, ciliated pubovoidal epithelium. Okay, so this is very very important thing, okay? Because if you know the epithelium, then the uh, ciliation, then the ciliation changes, okay? Ciliation changes. Next, coming to goblet glands, okay? Goblet glands, okay? If you take the airway, the airway has goblet glands, okay? And this goblet glands are mucositary glands, and the number of glands decreases as you move towards the goblet, okay? It decreases as you move towards the Okay. Okay. And there is no goblet glands over your terminal bronchioles and respiratory bronchioles. Okay. So this is the goblet gland which releases as you move towards the bronchial. Okay. Next is cartilage. Okay, cartilage. The cartilage part is very, very important because the cartilages are the one which is going to give you a skeletal structure and it can prevent the palatability of your airway. Okay, the cartilage is the one which is going to prevent the palatability of your airway. If you take the nasal cavity as such, okay, nasal bones have cartilage, but nasal cavity does not have any cartilage. Okay, does not have any cartilage. Even the nasal pharynx does not have any cartilage. Coming to the larynx, larynx has Complex cartilaginous structure. Complex cartilaginous structure. Okay. Coming to the trachea, you have C shaped, C shaped rings. Okay. C shaped ring means it will be like this. C. Okay. So if I am going to remove the C, the C will get into play. Okay. okay, if you take the bronchi, the bronchi will have irregular cartilaginous rings. Irregular cartilage rings. Okay, and there is no cartilage in your terminal bronchioles and respiratory bronchioles. There is no cartilage in your terminal bronchioles and respiratory bronchioles. Okay, so this is again a very, very important thing to note here. Okay, next coming to the smooth muscles. Okay, smooth muscles. Smooth muscles is the one, we all know that smooth muscles is the one which will react to the any kind of stimuli from the adrenaline reservoir. Right, so smooth muscle is absent as a whole in the trachea. Okay, so till the axis is absent and it will be a Encircled smooth muscle in trachea. Okay, encircled smooth muscle in trachea. Okay, then as you move downwards, okay, as you move down, downwards, what happens is the patient is going to have in bronchi posterior side. Smooth muscle. Okay, along the posterior side there will be smooth muscle. So front side there will be cartilage and posterior side there will be smooth muscle. Okay, and uh, as you go towards the respiratory bronchioles, respiratory bronchioles, still respiratory bronchioles, what happens is the smooth muscle increases. Smooth muscle increases. Okay, so smooth muscle increases means 
these uh, terminal bronchioles, respiratory bronchioles, and uh, above the terminal bronchioles, those areas are the middle part of the airway. And these areas are called the medium sized airways. So, where we have maximum amount of pulse muscle? In medium sized airways, that is, respiratory bronchioles. Terminal bronchioles and above the terminal bronchioles, we have maximum smooth muscle. Okay, maximum smooth muscle. Okay, then next is elastic fibers. Elastic fibers are absent in yes, exactly. And as we move down towards the respiratory bronchioles, the elastic fibers increases. Elastic fibers increases. Okay. And you will have maximum elastic fibers over the respiratory bronchiole and also over the areas of acinus. Also over the area of acinus. Okay. So you have maximum respiratory bronchioles over the area of terminal bronchioles, respiratory bronchioles, and acinus. Okay. So that is again a very, very important thing to know. Okay, a very important thing to know. Okay, so these are the few things about the characteristics of the airway. Okay, few things about the characteristics of the airway. Okay, so this is important because if you apply this practically in patients, then you will understand why this is important. Okay, why this is important. Okay, so I'm going to show this picture. Okay, if you see this picture, this is the picture of the Airway. Okay, so what happens here? We are going to have what many of cells in the initial part of your airway, pseudo stratified, ciliated, columnar, epithelium. Okay, and what are these things? What are these cells in between? Goblet cells. Okay, where do you have maximum goblet cells? Till your bronchi, till your bronchi, you have a lot of goblet cells. Okay. But as you go, what happens? The goblet cells decrease. Okay, goblet cells Okay. Then if you take your bronchi, okay, how what you have? You have cartilage. Okay, we have cartilage. Okay. But as you go down, what happens with cartilage? Cartilage is not present. Okay, cartilage is not present. And if you see your tracheal, yeah, how the cartilage is present? Complete initial plane, but as you do go down, what is going to happen? It becomes patchy. Okay, it becomes patchy. Okay, then if you take your uh, airway, then you have smooth muscle. Okay, smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is again very, very important part, which is going to be present all through the airway and it actually increases towards the terminal area. So, terminal area that will be for the medium size area. Okay, and um, then yeah, your elastic fibers also increases as you move towards the alveoli. Okay, so this picture is more or less about the alveoli of the alveoli. This is very important. What is known for it? Let's say the process and alveoli. Okay, so that is the one which will help you. Let's say the one which will help you. Whereas from your acute to your terminal, it's called it. Okay, because this is why this is very, very important. If only if you know this, then you can, whenever we see any uh, clinical questions, it will be easy to keep for you to understand in which area you can, you can have from the places or which area you can develop asthma. Okay, so which part of the area is more involved in asthma and why problem is important in knowing, in knowing. Hypertrophy happens and how this hypertrophy can be measured in chronic bronchitis or any bronchial asthma, etc. Okay, so this is very, very, very important for you for your uh, future understanding of respiratory medicine. Okay, so with this, we will go into the next part. Okay, next part. If you take the airway, okay, if you take the airway, the airway will start from the trachea and it will enter into the Bronchioles and then into the alveoli, we have right side, left side bronchi, right and left bronchi. Okay, right and left bronchi. Okay, so if you take the bronchi, okay, so the bronchi is going to divide at the level of T4 vertebra. 
Okay, it usually subtends an angle, okay, it forms an angle of 35 degree to 90 degree. 35 degree to 90 degree. Okay, 35 degree to 90 degree. Okay, and whenever it subtends an angle, whenever that is the pathology in the in-between part, what will happen is that bronchial carrying an angle will move forward, okay, move forward like this. Okay, so if it moves forward and it becomes more obtuse, then it means that there is some kind of pathology involved with the heart, okay, for the heart. Okay, now for example, this is the trachea and uh, this is the bronchial. A patient develops mild stenosis, okay. Whenever mild stenosis is there, what's going to happen? This is going to be lifted here. Whenever there is a left hand enlargement, what is going to happen? Your left bronchi will be pushed apart. When the left bronchi is pushed apart, what is going to happen? It will result in splaying of bronchi, which looks like someone is walking around. So it is called as walkman sign. Walkman sign. Walkman sign. Okay, so it looks like some, someone is uh, moving around. Okay, so it is called as Walkman sign. Okay, Walkman sign. So Walkman sign is seen in patients of uh, mitral stenosis. Okay, mitral stenosis. Okay, mitral stenosis. Very, very important thing. Okay, very, very important thing. Okay, so this is uh, one day. And this is if you take the right process, the right process which is straight. Okay. Straight and stubborn. Okay. If you take the left to bronchus, the left to bronchus is curved and narrow. Curved and narrow. Okay. If I'm going to put a foreign body here, or a ball here, okay, where this ball can lodge right side. So right side is more common as aspiration. Okay, if I have a ball here, okay, whether I can remove this ball easily or this ball easily, right side or left side. Right side ball, I can easily remove. Left side ball, I cannot remove. Okay. Whenever there is a secretion which forms uh, some kind of calcification or sedimentation, what will happen? That sedimentation will not be removed by your blood. Again and again, that sedimentation will be recurrent sedimentation, which will destroy the airway. When the airway gets destroyed, what will happen? There is going to be secondary infection. And this is the area where we can commonly develop. Bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis. Okay, bronchiectasis. So, bronchiectasis is more common over the left side of the lung. Okay, left side of the lung. Okay, very, very important. Okay. okay, then if you take aspiration, aspiration is more common on the right side. Okay, right side. Okay. Now, the most common segment. To get aspiration no, in blood, overall, it is going to be your right, sorry, right lower low superior segment. Right lower low superior segment, which is more commonly involved than right upper low posterior segment. Right lower row superior segment more common than right upper row posterior segment, and this is the most common side even in supine posture. Supine posture, okay. This is the most common in supine posture. So, in the patient, I will give the bottom next page, which is for that reason only. I will write there also. Okay, so if a patient is lying down like this, okay, what happens? This is the lung operation. 
Take this with the number of the patient. Whenever if you take any X-ray, okay, in later, okay, in the patient who is lying down, then what happens? The most common side to get the aspiration is somewhere around here and here. Okay, so it is going to be right lower lobe superior segment and right upper lobe posterior segment. So in lying down posture, it is going to be right lower lobe superior segment. Right, upper low, posterior segment of the lung. Posterior segment of the lung. Okay. Instead, imagine another patient is coming to you where the patient is standing. Okay. And the patient is vomiting. Okay. You will see here the patient is standing and vomiting. And suddenly he goes into aspiration mode. Standing and aspiration mode. Okay. Whenever your patient is standing and aspirating, okay, then the most common zone which is going to be involved, involved is going to be the right lower row posterior segment. Posterior segment. Okay, so it is going to be the breaking area of the lung which is going to involve whenever a patient is having aspiration in standing posture. So it is going to be the right lower row posterior segment. Posterior segment. That is the most common site of aspiration. Most common site of aspiration in patients who are vomiting in sitting and bending forward and standing posture. But if you take on lying down, it's going to be the superior segment. This has been asked as an MCQ in exam. Very, very important MCQ. Okay, so this is another important thing you should know. Okay, apart from this, I have left one more thing. Okay, left one more thing here. If you take the airway, okay, if you take the airway, so this is the trachea, bronchi, bronchios, alveoli. Okay. okay, so as we move from point A to point B, okay, what will happen with the diameter of the airway? Trachea is wide, okay. Trachea is a tube, okay. As we go towards the spread bubble, what is going to happen with the diameter? The diameter decreases. Okay, what will happen with the total cross section? So if you take here, the cross section is plus, okay. But as you move downwards towards the lung, what happens the cross section? Increases. Cross section increases. Okay. Next is velocity. Velocity. Okay. If I'm going to talk from here, okay, the sound intensity or velocity will be more near the first and second row. And what will happen till the last row? Velocity will decrease. Okay. I'm I'm blowing air into a balloon, for example. I'm going to blow air into the balloon. The next of the balloon will have more air will speed rather than the end of the balloon. Right? So what will happen to the velocity as you move downwards towards the smaller areas? Decreases. Velocity decreases. Okay. Then next is resistance. Okay, resistance. Okay. So now I'm going to walk in between these two rows. Okay. When I walk in between these two rows, I'm walking easily. And I go to the fifth row and I'm going inside the fifth row. Whether it will be the problem or easy problem. Difficult. The resistance will increase. Okay. So in larger array, the resistance is less. And as you move towards the smaller array, the resistance increases. And there is maximum resistance. And 
medium sized adhesive medium sized adhesive okay the last part here is turbulence turbulence okay turbulence okay so what happened here i'm walking towards the i mean or i'm going at towards the larger end larger end is the anime is very big so the air is going through a larger scale so the turbulence is less but as the air goes towards the smaller end what is going to happen the area is very small so what happens the air is struck hitting against each other so what happens to the turbulence increases okay turbulence increases so these things are these parameters are very very important because you should know the resistance is maximum at the medium side airways okay and turbulence also increases towards the medium side airways so okay? turbulence also increases towards the medium side airways okay so this is this is explained by a number called the physics you have told you Reynolds number. Okay, even in this one, they have told the Reynolds number. Okay, Reynolds number is whenever the Reynolds number is more than four thousand. Okay, then you will have turbulent flow. Turbulent flow. Okay, turbulent flow. Four thousand turbulent flow. Okay, so this is few things about your uh, physiology part of your respiratory medicine. Okay, and this is again one thing which you, we have to know is maximum resistance in the medium size airways. Okay, medium size airways. And one more thing here is if you take the lung, okay, so if you see that this is the trachea, this is going to divide the right and left to this, and this is the subcranial airways. Okay, subcranial airways. Okay, it will be somewhere around the uh, around the, uh, uh, or less than 90 degree. But whenever it increases, what it means is that there is going to be a change in enlargement. Okay, so you can see here, here there is a spring of your trachea, which is going to be called as your walking man side. Okay, walking man side. Okay, so whenever you are left the atrium, enlarges the side, then it will push the bronchus and it is going to cause the splay of the airway. It is playing of the airway. So, this is seen in patients with uh, mitral stenosis. Okay, not with patients with enlargement. Okay, what is this one? What is the in supine posture? What is the most common area in the aspiration? Right, lower low, superior segment, right, upper low, posterior segment. On standing posture, Right, lower and low, superior segment. Okay, superior segment. Okay, so this so posterior segment. These are the few basic part, posterior segment. So these are a few things which is very, very important when whenever they want to ask clinical based questions, okay, clinical based questions. Okay. Now coming to the next thing, okay, which is going to be cilia. Okay, cilia. Okay. If you take the airway, the airway is like this. Which has the epithelia. This is the cilia. Okay, cilia. So, in the cilia, the function is whenever you will add moves, this, moves in this direction, okay, the cilia will be in opposite direction. Okay, whenever air moves in this direction, air moves in this direction, cilia will be in opposite direction. Okay, opposite direction. And this mechanism is called as mucociliary clearance. Mucociliary clearance. Mucociliary clearance. Okay, so this movement of cilia in opposite direction is called as metachronism. Metachronism. Okay, metachronism. Metachronism. So this is the one which is going to happen here. 
So the CDR will be in the opposite direction. Okay, the CDR will be in the opposite direction to push the air. Okay, push the air. Okay, this mucociliary clearance is due to arrangement of the CDR in an arm called dynamic arm. Dynamic arm. Okay, dynamic arm. Dynamic arm is an arrangement where your microtubules are arranged. In nine plus two fashion, okay, nine plus two fashion, okay, nine plus two means it has nine microtubules outside and two microtubules inside, okay. So this nine plus two arrangement of microtubules will stabilize your cilia and help your cilia to be in a proper direction, okay, proper direction, okay. So how it is arranged usually is you take this as microtubule. Here we have the dynamic arm. Like this is present. Okay, where the microtubules are arranged in the form of 9 plus 2, are like 9 outside and 2 inside. Okay, 9 outside and 2 inside. Okay, whenever you have mutation in this dynamic arm, mutation in dynamic arm, what will happen? Your cilia is not function. Okay. When your cilia is not able to move, it is going to be immortal. And this is called there is immortal cilia syndrome. There are lots of conditions coming under immortal cilia syndrome. In that one example is Cartagenous syndrome. Cartagenous syndrome is like our SBI, which does not move forward or backward during working hours. So it is characterized by sinusitis, bronchial cases, and inverses situs, situs inverses. And it is also associated with an important eye, which is called as infertility. In, here, the infertility is due to weak sperms, okay? And it is called as asthenospermia. Asthenospermia. Okay, due to weak sperms called as asthenospermia. Okay, so it's asthenospermia. These sperms called as asthenospermia. Okay, so this is about your cilia, and this cilia is very, very important for mucociliary clearance. Okay, mucociliary clearance. Okay, so this is by process called metachromism, where there is a kind of which is attached with the microtubules. Which is again the form of 9 plus 2 arrangement. Whenever there is mutation in the dynamic arm of the microtubule, it is going to result in important cilia syndrome called as Arthur syndrome, characterized by SBI. Okay. Then what are the other things which are present in the airway? The other things which are present in the airway are going to be stem cells. Okay, stem cells. Okay, stem cells are also called as basal cells. Okay, in conducting zone, conducting zone. Okay, stem cells are basal cells which are present in the conducting zone, and there is also another cell which is called as clara cells. Clara cells. These clara cells also act like stem cells. Okay, clara cells act like stem cells. Then next is mucus producing cells. Okay, these mucus are produced by goblet cells. Goblet cells, which we call as mucosal glands, which are also called as goblet cells. Okay, goblet cells. Okay, so as I told you previously, we have another cell called 
clara cells okay clara cells these clara cells are also called as club cells club cells okay these club cells or clara cells are non ciliated cuboid epithelial cells cuboid epithelial cells present in terminal bronchioles terminal bronchioles these clara cells help in surfactant production surfactant production okay i don't also understand the function which is going to be called as detoxification detoxification so it is going to be helpful in production of surfactant and also detoxification okay detoxification okay next we have one important cell which is called as pulshitsky cells pulshitsky cells okay pulshitsky cells these cells are also called as a food cells okay a food cells what is a food cell is apparently untreated endocrine cells okay apparently untreated endocrine cells okay so these are actually neurosecretory cells or neuroendocrine cells neuroendocrine cells okay where they have a dense pore vesicle okay which inside it contains lot of neurotransmitters like this okay the usual endocrine cells or neuroendocrine cells present in that inside these dense pore vesicles are calcitonin cgrt calcitonin g related peptide and serotonin okay these are the neuroendocrine cells which are present inside the dense pore vesicles dense pore vesicles okay so these are called as pulshitsky cells or a pore cells okay pulshitsky cells or a pore cells then next we have important cell smooth muscle okay so i told you smooth muscle are maximum over medium sized uh, arteries and it is maximum at the terminal bronchial level bronchial level okay then resistance given by the smooth muscle causes increase in resistance over the area okay because of the increase in the smooth muscle causes resistance over the area okay resistance over the area okay the most potent the most potent bronco constrictor okay the most potent bronco constrictor is going to be leukotrienes okay followed by we have substance b acetylcholine histamine okay so these are substances which are going to cause bronco constriction okay bronco constriction and the most most potent bronco constrictor is going to be leukotrienes followed by substance b acetylcholine and histamine leukotrienes substance b acetylcholine and histamine okay histamine okay and if you think the most potent bronchodilator most potent bronchodilator okay it is going to be vat what is vat vasodilatory intestinal peptide okay and we have nancy okay nancy are non adrenergic 
नॉन कोलिनर्जिक पेप्टाइड्स नॉन कोलिनर्जिक नॉन कोलिनर्जिक पेप्टाइड्स ओके अपार्ट फ्रॉम दिस वे हैव अदर ब्रोंकोटाइडास इट इज गोइंग टू बी नाइट्रिक ऑक्साइड एंड बीटा टू रिसेप्टर्स नाइट्रिक ऑक्साइड एंड बीटा टू आर गोइंग टू बी अदर ब्रोंकोटाइडास ओके ब्रोंकोटाइडास Okay. This is very very important thing. Okay, so whenever the patient is uh, angry, is there? Okay, there will be maximum bronco constriction at around six a.m. in the morning and maximum bronco dilation at six p.m. in the evening. Okay, so if you take maximum bronco constriction, okay, so this bronco constriction usually occurs in the Early hours of the day, and this bronchial dilation will occur around the evening. Okay, so maximum chances of getting bronchial asthma during this time early hours of the day. Okay, and bronchial dilation is maximum around six p.m. Six p.m. Okay, so this is again very very important thing to know. Okay, then next we have another cells. Called pulmonary alveolar macrophages. In alveoli, we have macrophages, and these pulmonary alveolar macrophages are also called as dust cells. Okay, these pulmonary alveolar macrophages is also called as dust cells. Okay, dust cells. Then next is we have another important thing called bronco. Arterial ratio. Okay, so whenever you get your bronchus and artery, okay, the bronchoarterial ratio is more than point six to point seven. Okay, whenever this happens, okay, always your artery is bigger than the Bronchus. Okay, if your artery is bigger than the bronchus. Whenever your bronchus becomes becomes bigger than the artery, okay, then the bronchoarterial ratio will become more than one. Okay, more than one. Okay, and this is seen in bronchial cases. Bronchial cases. Bronchial cases involving the medium-sized airways. That is. Just below the bronchi and just above the bronchioles. So segmental and sub-segmental bronchioles are getting involved in it. Then what is going to happen? You are going to have a bigger bronchi than the artery. Okay. And if you see here, how it looks like. This is called as segmental sign. So signal cell sign is seen. Signal cell sign is seen in bronchial cases. Okay, bronchial cases, and this occurs whenever, whenever your bronchial is bigger than the artery. Okay, so this is called a signal cell sign. Okay, this occurs whenever your bronchial arterial ratio is more than what? Okay, bronchial arterial ratio is more than what? Okay, so this is very very important. Okay, okay, this is very very important. Okay, so with this we are finishing the characteristics of the airways. Now coming to the last part of the airway, which is going to be the alveoli. Okay, alveoli. If you take alveoli, you can see this alveoli. Will be somewhat like this. Okay, like this. Where we have here type one pneumocytes. Okay, and in the corners we have type two pneumocytes. Okay, so which is more in number? Type one pneumocytes is more in number. So in the alveoli, typical alveoli, nineteen to ninety five percent is going to be type one pneumocytes, whereas five to ten percent of cells 
are going to be titled lymphocyte. Okay, this type 1 lymphocyte is also called as pavement epithelium. Okay, pavement epithelium and these contain non dividing cells. Non dividing cells. Okay, non dividing cells that is, they won't multiply or they won't repair. Okay, so these cells. Okay, or more prom prominent or known for injury. Okay, vulnerable to injury. This is type 1 pneumocyte. Okay, whereas within type 2 pneumocyte, it is around 5 to 10% of the total cells, and these are also stem cells. Also can function as stem cells. Okay, type 2 pneumocyte can also function as stem cells. And the most important function of this type of mosaic is to produce surfactant. Okay, so what is the role of the surfactant? Surfactant is the one which has the capacity to divide and reconstitute type 1 cells whenever they are getting injured. Whenever your type 1 cells are getting injured, the cell which comes for to replace the type 1 pneumocyte is going to be your type 2 pneumocytes. Okay, but the main function of this type 2 pneumocyte is going to be surfactant production. Okay, surfactant production. So if you see here, this is an activity angular microgram where you can see a type 1 pneumocyte and in the corners you have type 2. Okay, so majority of cells are going to be type 1 pneumocytes and minority cells are going to be type 2 pneumocytes. This is very, very important. Okay, so what is the role of surfactant? What is the role of surfactant? Okay, so coming to the details of surfactant, surfactant is produced by type 2 pneumocyte. Type 2 pneumocyte produces it. Okay, this surfactant is also produced by Clara cells. So, Clara and type 2 both together form this surfactant. Okay, this surfactant contains lipid and protein. Okay, and this lipoprotein is due to a content called Less thin or dipalmitoly phosphatidylcholine. Dipalmitoly phosphatidylcholine. Okay, and this is also called as pingo myelin. Pingo myelin. Lithium or dipalmitoly phosphatidylcholine. This is the lipid part, and you have protein part where there are four important proteins called as surfactant protein A, B, C, and D. So it is called SPA, B, C, D. Okay, SPA, B, C, D. Okay, this SPA and D. are associated with markers of lung maturity. So whenever it is present, it means that lung has matured. Okay, so surfactant protein A and B are markers of lung maturity. Okay, so this surfactant production happens all through the day and the surfactant is removed by pulmonary and alveolar macro okay from the alveolar macrophages, which is also called as dust cells. Okay, and it is also aided by another one cell called GMCSF. GMCSF. So whenever there is a problem, okay, and what happens here? Pulmonary alveolar macrophages is not working. Or your PMCSF has gone for mutation. 
what else? Okay. Outside the annual. Layer of the layer annual. Okay. This layer of water will try to pull your annual inside. Okay, we try to put the alveoli inside. Okay, whereas your alveoli has surfactant, which will try to push your alveoli outside. Okay, outside. So what is going to happen? There is a outward pull and there is a inward pull. Okay, the inward pull is because of water, and the outward pull is because of the Okay, now what happens is well, now what happens? The patient has surfactant deficiency. Whenever there is a surfactant deficiency, who is going to be more than the water? So the water is still the alveolar. So the alveolar will go for collapse. So what is going to happen is alveolar will go for collapse. Okay, alveolar goes for collapse. Okay, so annual post for collapse means what is going to happen next is this is the this is the alveolar. Okay, so if I take this as an alveolar, this is an alveolar. Okay, now this alveolar is blown like this. Okay, if the alveolar is blown like this, you can write blown the alveolar because then what will happen? I can do easily. But at least that glasses. Okay. And every time what will happen when four inhaler. Every time four will inhale to expand the alveolar. So what happens when one of the inhaler? After some time, I my nostrils will become tired. So what happens? I cannot breathe in or breathe out. So what will happen? The alveolar will be in a collapse state, and I cannot put effort. So what will happen? Respiratory. Respiratory. So what is going to happen whenever you have alveoli not having content it is going to result the respiratory disperse. Okay. So to open up collapsed alveoli, collapsed alveoli, the work of breathing increases. Okay, work of breathing increases. The increase in work of breathing will result in respiratory distress. Respiratory distress. The respiratory distress will result in hypoxemia. Okay, the hypoxemia will cause damage to alveoli. Okay, and because of the damage to the alveoli, what will happen is there will be a formation of a fibrous layer over alveoli. And this fibrous layer is going to be called as hyaline membrane. Membrane. Okay, membrane. Okay, so what will happen ultimately your alveoli will have a fibrin membrane covering. Okay, which will further impair the ganglion exchange. Okay, and whenever there is an hypoxemia, hypoxemia, all the blood vessels in the body will go for vasodilation and pulmonary vessel will go for pulmonary vasoconstriction. Okay, whenever there is a pulmonary vasoconstriction, what is going to happen? Right heart pressure increases. Right heart pressure increases. Okay. Whenever right heart pressure increases, what is going to happen? Usually, there will be an opening between your left atrium and the right atrium called as AAC. When right heart pressure increases, what will happen to the blood? The blood will move from the left side to the right side. So, what is going to happen? Normally, it is going to be from the right side to the sorry, left side to the right side. Now, when right heart pressure increases, what will happen? The blood will move from the right to left. When good blood is getting mixed with bad, what is going to happen? Cyanosis will develop. 
nước biển như là đất phải là một sức ok and it is going to be formation of identity ok and because of this we developing cyanosis with the higher temporary formation this is also called as higher temporary disease Pyrimetry disease. Okay, pyrimetry disease. Okay. Now, only only when your alveoli has an when you take an X-ray, the X-ray will look. When it contains an X-ray, the X-ray will look black. Okay. Now, whenever your alveoli is collapsed, there is no air. So, how your lung will look white? So, this is called as white lung or washed out lung. White lung. White lung, okay, white lung, where you are going to have decreased lung volume, okay, along with that you can see lot of areas of under perfused and under aerated areas and that is going to give you ground glass appearance, ground glass appearance, ground glass appearance. Going to give you ground glass appearance. That is going to give you ground glass appearance. Okay, that is going to give you ground glass appearance, white lung or decreased lung volume. Okay, so this is what typical thing which is seen in these patients. Okay, with iron and disease. So, what is this? This is an alveolar, typical alveolar, where you have alveolar metabolism called this person there. And this is siphon hemocyte. What is the name of the corner? Siphon hemocyte. Okay, siphon hemocyte. Okay, what is the name of the siphon hemocyte? Siphon hemocyte are non-divided cells. It is just form the form the skeleton. Okay, form the skeleton. Whereas siphon hemocyte is the one which is going to form the cyte product. And whenever you are siphon hemocyte injured, it is the siphon hemocyte which is coming and replacing the Okay, now imagine this baby is coming to you. TTN is the most common etiology. What is going to happen? What is happening to the respiratory? Filled up with water, okay, and it is not able to expand further, it is going for collapse, okay, going for collapse, okay. As the collapse bursts further, what is going to happen? You can see the bulk of breathing increasing, and you can see secretion. So, what can happen to the baby? It is the other side. Why the other side of this? Because it is the other from right to Left side, and what kind of lung is going to get here? Get in the white lung. Okay, white lung. Get okay. So, this is the feature of your patient has been having a number of disease. Okay, having a number of Coastal and intercoastal. What happened to the respiratory effort here? Respiratory effort has increased. You can see here, increased respiratory effort. Okay, respiratory effort. The front end sinuses in the baby, and this is the feature of feature of high level disease. Okay, high level disease is very very important. Okay. okay, now a mother is coming to you. Okay, the mother is coming to you and asking you, my child. Okay, my child. Uh, previously, I had high level disease. This is my second child. Okay, I have a dog with it. This baby also with it. Develop higher level disease or not. Okay, so what you are going to do is you are going to advise the patient to undergo certain test. Okay, so what is the first test we can do? Then? We can go for lamellar body count. Lamellar body count. Okay, what is this lamellar body count? Okay, what is this lamellar cells? Our storage body for Okay, right. 20 weeks of gestation. Okay, if there is an increase in the lamellar body, they don't have any definite number. 
Okay, it means lamina complex present. Then it means that lung maturity. Okay, then the second thing is you are going to see for this is the single myelin ratio. This is the single myelin ratio. Okay, when usually at about 20 weeks of gestation, the resistance level increases. Okay, whenever your endless ratio is more than two. Then it means lung maturity is present. Okay. Then the third thing what you can do is you can measure the activity of phosphatidyl glycerol or choline. Okay. This is usually done at around 25 weeks of gestation age. Okay, this is in age. Okay, so how are you going to do this? Okay, what you're going to do is you're going to take the aromatic fluid, okay, and put it in a test tube. Okay, and what it contains, it contains protein. Okay, when it has protein, when you shake the protein, what will happen? It will form bubbles. Okay, so bubbles, if present, okay, then lung maturity is present. Okay, bubbles is present, then lung maturity is present, and this is done by a test called Shade test, okay. Shade test. So shade test is a subjective test where you take the amniotic fluid, put it in a test tube, and shade the test tube, and you can see the bubbles like this. Okay, bubbles like this. Okay. So this is called a shade test. I'll show you the shade test. So this is a test tube, okay, where you take the uh, amniotic fluid, shade the and after getting water out, there will be bubble spiders. Okay. If bubbles is present, then lung maturity is present. If there is no bubble, then it means that lung maturity is negative. Okay, lung maturity is not present. Okay. Imagine now a baby is coming to you, born, born baby is coming to you, okay, and you do a shape test and shape test is negative. Okay. And what we are going to do now? You are going to deliver because baby is in hypoxia, the mother is having pre eclampsia. Okay, you have to deliver the baby. Okay, so I or less than 34 weeks of gestation. Okay, so your baby from inside is singing one song. Okay, what song is singing? Daddy, daddy, oh my daddy. Okay, it's me. Okay. And you want your beta intact. So, what are you going to do? When you want your beta intact, then you have to give beta with the zone. Okay. So, you have to go beta with the zone, which is it's more drug of choice than dexam in the zone. Okay, so when you want your beta intact, you have to go for beta in the zone. Okay, beta in the zone. Because I told you steroids are stimulators of surfactant production. Okay, so you go for steroids, okay, in the form of beta in the zone. Okay, now your baby is delivered. Okay, the baby is delivered. So when the baby is delivered, okay, baby is delivered now. Okay, and the baby is having respiratory. Distress. Okay, so what scale you are using? So you are checking for Alga scale score. And what is under scale? This was one famous English question, right? In pediatrics, named Silverman scale. Okay, so both scales are checking and baby is having distress. Okay, so whenever you check and the distresses, my Okay, what you're going to do is you're going to put the baby on C pad. Okay, if the distress is my, you're going to put the baby on C pad. Okay, whenever it is moderate to severe, moderate to severe. Okay, the treatment, what you're going to do is surfactant replacement. Surfactant replacement. 
Okay, so this is my. So how this effect is replaced by a technique called if you want to ensure the baby intact, you go for ensure technique. Okay, so what is ensure technique is you intubate the child. Okay, and then you give surfactant. And once the child recovers, extubated. Extubated. Okay, so what is the surfactant which we are usually using? Okay, so when you go to pediatric posing, they will tell that, sir, give sir, what is sir? Surfactant. Okay, we have two surfactants here. One is going to be luminactant. The other one is going to be baractant. Baractant. Luminactant and baractant. Okay, so these are the two surfactants which are available for insure technique. When you integrate the Surfactant, HTLA, the for the HTLA. Okay, surfactant, HTLA, the two daily the surfactant. Okay, then we're going to HTLA, the 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 HTLA, for type 1 and type 2 angular cells are lymphocytes. Okay, for type 1 angular cells, we are going to have heavy OD, which is going to be a marker, apocalypse 5, which is going to be a marker, and carboxyphenate, which is going to be a marker. Okay, coming to Type 2 angular cells, type 2 angular cells, we have surfactant protein A, B, C, and E. Okay, a common marker for both type 1 and type 2 angular cells is going to be, it is a common marker for both surfactant for the and for the which is going to be this. Okay, so these are the few things which is very, very, very important things about the anatomy part of your Okay, and the rating what you are following is called the initial technique in basic section D. We integrate use the and and so for Okay, so this is about your. Anatomy part of your pulmonology, and this is very, very important because we are in various areas, we are going to go through this things. Okay, and before completing this, for completion sake, I will go into another one that is what charge the flow. Charge the flow is one way the patient is going to have C for coloboma of H for heart disease, A for atresia of quietly, okay, atresia of nose, okay, and patient has retarded flow, genital anomaly, and ear this, okay. Here, if you see the eye of the baby, the eye of the baby will have quietly, okay, this, okay, this, okay, the patient is going to have quietly atresia, okay, quietly atresia. When the patient has quietly atresia, okay, what is going to happen? The final is at least. Okay. Now, patient is breathing in and breathing out. Whether the patient child will be able to get air inside? No. Okay. So, at that time, the patient will be having cyanosis. Okay. Now, baby starts crying. When baby starts crying, it will open the mouth and cry. No air no goes inside. What is happening to the cyanosis? Okay, so this is called the cyclical cyanosis. Okay, cyclical cyanosis, where it is going to be during the baby being silent, there is no cyanosis, and the baby starts by there is an improvement. Whenever the baby is still, there is cyanosis is present, and the baby starts by cyanosis will disappear. Okay, what is the present tell to assess? Okay, you just take a register, put inside, 